Hello and welcome back. Uh, we are now in the third week of the semester. First week, we uh, we did a quick overview of what the course was going to be like, went over the syllabus. Last week, we began uh, on our first set of slides, and you, you watched a couple videos um, within this video. I know that's a little bit weird. And uh, so this week, you know, I want to review that real quickly, and then uh continue on with those slides so i purposely didn't start blackboard or anything uh, until now so that you can see you know where to find everything so here i have blackboard open and uh under courses under courses you're gonna see uh whichever one you're in you know this is the monday morning Monday afternoon, Monday night, doesn't matter which one you click on. I've just been using this one here. They're all identical. You'll only see one, so click on the one you got. And then under lessons, um, you know, here here's the uh, lecture I posted last week, and here's the one from the first week. And we're using material right now from module one. So um, Module one, we were in the middle of these slides. So let me open that back up. So we were doing these slides. Also, uh, you know, we had within there some of the materials I used during that. I, I used, showed you this video on the four stroke cycle. We talked about atmospheric pressure. We talked about knocking and pre-ignition. We didn't look at the runaway diesel one or any of these others yet. Uh, the runaway diesel, I don't know if we'll even bother, um, but that's just something you can look at for kicks. So we're into the slides here. And let me uh, let me turn off my video here a minute. Okay. And you should be able to, uh, let's see, we'll go full screen with that. All right, so you should remember we were talking about, you know, these terms, top dead center, bottom dead center, what a stroke is. We started talking about vacuum and pressure and then into the four stroke cycle. Uh, we did intake and compression in, you know, a fair amount of detail. So remember top dead center uh, crankshaft is at the very top zero degrees, pistons at its highest position. So out in the lab, we saw that, remember when I stuck the quarter inch extension down through the spark plug hole on the engine on a stand, and rotated it. Uh, those of you in the Monday night um, lab haven't seen that yet, um, unless you're watching this afterwards. And uh, bottom dead center, you know, the, the piston's at its lowest point, and the crankshaft journal is at 180 degrees. And a stroke is when it moves from top to bottom or bottom to top. And then we talked about how the speed of the piston is not constant. It comes to a stop at the top. It comes to a stop at the bottom. And anywhere near the top or near the bottom, it's moving really, really slowly. It hits its maximum speed about halfway up the cylinder. Then it slows down again, comes to a stop, starts moving downward, hits maximum speed halfway down. So it's really a jerky kind of motion. It's not a very smooth, you know, like a rotary engine is. Then we talk about atmospheric pressure and how it's caused by the weight of the air and uh, how it varies from day to day based on the barometer reading, but it also varies based on your altitude. Uh, I know from uh, from flying, and I mentioned this, that you know the higher up you go, the less air there is up there, and so uh, things like air fuel mixture have to be adjusted engine makes more power at sea level than it does at say 5,000 feet because the air is denser, there's more oxygen in it. So we talked about, I showed you the vacuum gauge and how, you know, when we say vacuum, what we really mean is any pressure that's le less than atmospheric pressure. And I went through that with the gauge and pointed that out to you. So the only time we're gonna be higher than atmospheric pressure in an engine is if we have forced induction, a turbocharger, supercharger, something like that. Otherwise, we're relying on atmospheric pressure to push the air into the engine. And so uh, the difference in pressure from outside the engine to inside the cylinders is what's going to cause that air to rush in and fill up the cylinders. 
Uh, let's see. We talked about how the, the pressure in the cylinder is the lowest. The pressure outside of the engine is the highest. And inside the intake manifold, it's somewhere in between. So air flows from outside the engine into the intake, where it's lower pressure. And then from the intake into the cylinder, where it's even lower pressure. Then we talked about the intake stroke and said, you know, there's a lot of things that affect how much air gets in during the intake stroke. How fast is the engine going, which determines how long the valves are open and how long air has to rush in. I talked about how there's inertia. So the air, uh, when you first open the intake valve, it takes a little bit to get it moving. And then after the piston hits bottom dead center, the air has inertia and keeps on moving for a little while. So we don't have to slam that intake valve shut right at bottom dead center. We can give it uh, you know, a few more degrees for air to flow in before we close the intake valve. And, and um, even though the piston's moving upward, it's moving so slowly that it's really negligible. We talked about how uh, the pressure affects airflow into the cylinder, the size of the intake valve, how many intake valves, uh, the engine on a stand we've been working with uh, out in the shop that has, you know, four valves per cylinder, two intake, two exhaust. Other engines only have one, uh, but those valves might be bigger. So all of these design things go into how well this engine breathes. And also, not just how well it breathes, but at what RPM it breathes the best. Other things, how long the intake valve remains open. Uh, you know, how many degrees of crankshaft rotation do we leave that intake valve open? And uh, the other thing, how long the valve opens time-wise, how many milliseconds? And that's really based a lot on engine RPM. The faster the engine's spinning, the less time there is for air to get into the cylinder. So there is a, uh, you know, there's a limitation to how fast an engine can run. When it gets to the point where the intake valve is open for such a short period of time that it, you know, it just can't take any more air in, you know, that's it. You're topped out. You're not going any faster. Then we talked about the compression stroke. We talked about compression ratio, you know, the difference in pressure between uh, total volume when the cylinder is, you know, pistons at bottom dead center and what they call clearance volume, which is when the pistons at top dead center. And so, if the cylinder is 10 times as large with the piston at the bottom as it is with the piston at the top, that's going to be a 10 to 1 ratio. We looked up uh, several compression specs during the last week when we were doing compression tests, when we were doing cylinder leakage tests, and uh, you know we found that kind of normal ratios are 8 to 1, 10 to 1, 12 to 1. 12 to 1 is getting kind of high. Um, so we learned all about that. I don't want to reteach the entire thing. And uh, then it's time to move on to the power stroke. So this is where we left off last week, right at the end of this slide here, ready to go, go into this one. So we're talking about a spark ignition engine. If it's a diesel, um, there is no spark plug. And what ignites the air fuel mixture is the high temperature caused by really high compression in a diesel. So the compression pressures in a diesel are way higher than they are in gas. If we, if we applied that kind of compression pressure to a gas engine, the results would be very destructive to the engine. So, you know, gasoline is, is much more, uh, volatile. It's much, um, it's much less stable than diesel fuel is. So in a spark ignition engine, rather than a compression ignition engine, the uh, power stroke, the beginning of combustion, is controlled by the spark plug and when the spark plug fires. So it says here the spark plug ignites the air fuel mixture near top dead center. So this process is beginning when you're still on the compression stroke. The piston is almost stopped. It's close to the top, so it's not moving very fast. But we need to get the combustion process started a little bit ahead of time. We need to lead this by a bit. 
because it does take a few milliseconds for uh, the spark plug to actually light the air fuel mixture and for the air fuel mixture to catch on fire and start burning. If we wait until the piston's at top dead center before we start that process, by the time the air fuel mixture burns and creates any pressure, the piston would already be part way down in the cylinder and we would lose a whole lot of power because, you know, we're expanding into a much bigger space. We're not going to get the same kind of pressure. So I have a couple slides on timing I'll show you in a minute, but we'll just talk about it first. So piston is nearing top dead center. Uh, it might be 10 degrees before top dead center, 15, 20, 30. Uh, this is determined by the computer nowadays based on things like engine load and engine RPM. So it changes all the time. As you're driving down the road, if you had a scan tool and you were watching Spark Advance on the scan tool, you would see that as your driving conditions change, uh, the, the Spark timing is going to change constantly. So what happens, the, the Spark plug fires, it begins a, a combustion process. The air and fuel are uh, ignited. They start to burn. And that burning air fuel mixture expands, expands quite a bit. And that creates a lot of pressure on top of the piston. And this is what actually generates the power in an engine, the power stroke, and that expanding, burning, expanding air fuel mixture, causing pressure on top of the piston. If you think about it, this is the only stroke out of the four stroke cycle that's actually contributing to making the engine rotate and generating power. The other three strokes are parasitic. You know, they're uh, taking power away from the engine, but they are necessary for the engine to run. When we talk about, uh, you know, how efficiently a gasoline engine runs, one of the things we talk about is friction. You know, that takes away some of the power. But the other thing we talk about is what's known as pumping losses. And pumping losses, that's the, the energy required for the engine to pull in the air fuel mixture compress it and then get rid of it on the exhaust stroke. So only the power stroke is doing anything for us. So the pressure in the cylinder from the burning expanding air fuel mixture pushes the uh, piston downward in the cylinder causing the crankshaft to rotate. So uh, let me find these other slides here on uh, timing. Just real quick here. So right here. It's just a couple of slides. Open that up a sec. All right, so let's look at base timing, okay? So base timing is kind of built in, mechanically fixed, uh, based on, you know, where the crankshaft position sensor is located, and uh, just how things have been designed. This is with no spark advance at all, base timing. So it's never going to, well, I shouldn't say never, but th this is like the baseline. It usually advances from here. So eight degrees before top dead center, 10 degrees before top dead center. This is a very normal kind of standard sort of base timing number. So if you somehow, you know, disabled any spark advance mechanism, this is the timing the engine would run at. So notice, and I think I can uh, annotate here. So notice right now we're running at 1,000 RPM, right? Ignition is occurring 10 degrees before top dead center. Um, it takes three milliseconds, right? 0 0.003 seconds for that air fuel mixture here to become uh you know completely combusted completely burned right? so you can't really change that very very much so in that three milliseconds they're showing at this 1000 rpm uh, the engine reaches this point 
10 degrees after top dead center. So spark plug fires here, three milliseconds later, the engine is over here. And it takes three milliseconds for the air fuel mixture to burn. So um, this is where we will reach our maximum combustion pressure, pressure, right? So over here, let me, let me get rid of this stuff here. And see if I can uh, remember how to erase it. Yeah, erase it all, right? There we go. So here, number one, number two, right? Ignition and combustion start. It says flame propagation. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this is basically, this is when the spark plug fires. We are, up in this case, 10 degrees before top dead center. So the, the piston is just slowing down, ready to come to a stop at the top of the compression stroke. Not really moving very fast, but it's still moving. Um, the, the action is more here, the crankshaft, you know, moving more sideways like that, as opposed to moving up like that. Right? So here's where the spark plug fires. You know, three milliseconds later, at this RPM, the engine has hit 10 degrees after top dead center. So that's where maximum uh, pressure occurs. And then it keeps burning for a little bit right here. They're showing end of combustion. So we have to light it before top dead center in order for the uh, compression pressure to maximize at about 10 degrees after. That's where you want the most pressure on the top of the piston, about 10 degrees after top dead center. There's a way that I can erase the entire. Uh, yeah, let's see here. No, that's not it. <laughs> uh, there we are. Okay, better. So let, let me go to the next slide here. And. Uh, Come on. Oh, hang on. I got to turn off annotations. It's early in the semester. Bear with me. There we go. So I got to turn that back on now. So here we are now um, with the engine at 2000 RPM. So at 2000 RPM, you know, the, the crank is spinning twice as fast in the same three milliseconds. Instead of going, you know, 20 degrees, going from 10 before to 10 after, now it's going 38 degrees in the same amount of time because it's spinning faster. So if we want maximum cylinder pressure to happen here, and we do, we have to start sooner. We have to start way back here at 28 degrees before top dead center. So we have to advance the spark so that three milliseconds later, we're still at that same spot we were on that last slide when we were only spinning at 1,000 RPM. The key is starting the uh, combustion process at the correct time so that it maximizes right there, 10 degrees after. So the faster the engine spins, the sooner, you know, at 4,000 RPM, we might be over here at, you know, 40 degrees. I'm just guessing here if that's 40. But in order to make that combustion process reach its maximum pressure here. So here's the way I think of it, all right? Um, and I'm just going to work in this area over here. So I'm a quarterback. I'm standing here. Uh, my receiver is running across the field this way, right? I want to hit the receiver here. That's where I want the football to reach the receiver. If I wait now, right? If I wait till the receiver is at that point, now I throw the ball, right? By the time the ball gets there, 
this guy is over here. I'm going to be too late. Right? So if my engine is rotating fast and I don't fire the spark plug until here, by the time pressure builds up, I'm going to be way over here too late. Too late. Whoops. I don't know what just happened there. I <laughs> just got, uh, there we are. Huh. Crazy WebEx. Yeah, so, so that would be too late if the pressure maximizes here. So if I'm the quarterback and I want to hit my receiver here, right, I got to throw the ball here when the receiver is still back here. Then by the time the ball reaches that spot, the receiver hits that spot, we have a completion. Another thing would be if you're if you're shooting at a moving target, let's say you're out doing trap shooting or skeet shooting or whatever. If you shoot the gun where that clay pigeon is now, uh, you're going to miss. You have to lead it by a bit. You have to shoot ahead of it so that the bullet and the, uh, the clay pigeon reach the same spot at the same time. So that's how it is with Spark Advance. If you're um, intending for maximum pressure to happen at 10 degrees before top dead center, you know, at, at a whoops, low RPM, you can light the spark plug here. At a higher RPM, you're going to have to light it sooner. And an even higher RPM, you're going to have to light it even sooner. So as you drive down the road and uh, engine RPM changes, the spark advance is going to continuously change. So hopefully that wasn't more confusing than enlightening. Um, let's see. I did have another uh, another slide on here. Nope, that's it. So let me close this. Go back to power stroke here. All right. So let's see. Spark plug ignites air fuel mixture near top dead center. So near, not at. Uh, and the faster we're going the earlier we have to light it. Burning gases expand, increasing the pressure in the cylinder that pushes the piston down. Um, no matter how fast the engine is turning, it still takes that three milliseconds for the uh, air fuel mixture to, to burn, you know, to reach maximum pressure. Um, so at higher speeds, combustion must start sooner to maximize the pressure. Question here, how can we maximize combustion pressure? So realistically, anything we can do to maximize compression pressure should maximize combustion pressure. Because what combustion is doing is taking your compression pressure and multiplying it. So if I begin with low compression, uh, I'm not going to make that much power. If I have higher compression, then I'm going to have higher combustion pressure. If I don't use compression to accomplish that, how else do I increase the uh, pressure in the cylinder? Get more air in. So open the throttle more. That's going to cause more air to flow into the cylinder. Compression pressure is going to be higher. Combustion pressure is going to be higher more pressure on the cylinder, more power uh, created by the engine. Uh, besides opening the throttle more, you know, I can have design things like we talked about before on the intake stroke, bigger valves, more valves, open them farther, keep them open longer. Um, I can use forced induction, turbocharger, supercharger to cram air into that cylinder. Anything that raises the air pressure in that cylinder at the point of combustion is going to raise the pressure in the cylinder when combustion happens. In other words, combustion is going to, whatever you have before the spark plug fires is going to be multiplied by the firing of the plug and the burning of the air fuel mixture. There was a, a term a couple minutes ago, and I said I'd talk more about it. A term I said uh, propagates the flame. Uh, has to propagate. So picture you're standing um, at the corner of a field, and it's a field of dry grass. 
and you take a match. I don't recommend doing this. My, my father was a fireman and, you know, they got called out to fight grass fires all the time. And sometimes firemen get injured on that. And that's, that's a shame. So I'm not saying you should do this. I'm just saying picture it. You've got a, uh, a field of dry grass. You're standing in a corner of it. You drop a match in the corner. The entire field is not instantly ablaze. Right? What happens is you have a flame front. So the flame starts in that corner and then it burns across the field until eventually the entire field uh, is on fire. So what would be faster? How could I get the entire field on, on fire faster? Well, this would be really dumb, but it would work, right? I stand in the middle of the field. I drop a match. Now the flames are spreading out in all directions equally, and they reach the four corners much faster than if it has to burn from one corner all the way across to the other corner. So some engine designs put the spark plug right in the middle of the cylinder. In fact, uh, that's way more common than it used to be. And so now when that, uh, that hemispherical combustion chamber, that you know, semi-circle, semi-spherical, semi right, hemispherical, that um, spark plug's right in the middle. When that spark plug fires, the flame front reaches all parts of the cylinder much more quickly than if the spark plug is over on one side like it is on a lot of uh, a lot of older engines spark plug was off to the side so when the spark plug fired the flame front had to travel across this uh not quite as efficient and um, maybe results in less power results in you know not quite as good fuel efficiency too so think about that the, it seems like the air fuel mixture ignites all at once instantaneously, but it really doesn't. There is a flame front, so they say the flame propagates around the cylinder. It starts in one spot right at the spark plug, and then it moves outward, propagates outward from the spark point where the spark fired until uh, the entire cylinder is involved in, in a flame. So the last stroke in the four-stroke cycle, one that's often, uh, you know, kind of ignored, is the exhaust stroke. So let's talk about what happens, all right? So near bottom dead center of the power stroke, the exhaust valve opens. There is absolutely no point uh, leaving the exhaust valve closed at the end of the power stroke because all of the energy in the fuel has basically been exhausted by then. Uh, the, the volume in the cylinder has expanded so much from the piston moving downward that there's, there's no real pressure anymore. You're not accomplishing anything uh, with that pressure anymore. So the piston's coming to a stop. Uh, it's slowing way down, moving towards the bottom. So what we do is we open the exhaust valve before that piston even gets to the bottom. And what little pressure there is left in the cylinder at that point, um, it starts flowing out that exhaust valve before the piston gets to the bottom and starts moving back up. What does this do for us? Well, anything that can make the engine breathe better can make it make more power. So the sooner and the more efficiently we can get that exhaust out of the cylinder, uh, the better off we are. So we're not quite to the bottom, the exhaust valve opens, exhaust starts coming out, piston hits bottom, starts moving back up again. Now the exhaust is being pushed out of the cylinder. And uh, when the uh, piston gets near the top, of the exhaust stroke. So this is a little bit weird, but it, it hasn't reached top yet. The exhaust stroke is not over yet, right? Piston's still moving upward. It's slowing down. It's almost come to a stop. So it's not really pushing the exhaust out, you know, much. At that point, the intake valve is opening. 
So for a little bit of time at the end of the exhaust stroke, beginning of the intake stroke, both valves are open. And what that allows, it allows the incoming air, right? So the air coming in from the intake manifold or air and fuel to help kind of sweep the remaining exhaust gas out of the cylinder to help push it out. And that just uh, makes sure that you don't trap any exhaust in the cylinder when you close the valve before opening the intake valve, right? So you're allowing the incoming air to kind of push the, the exhaust out. And that process is called scavenging. You know, you've heard of a scavenger hunt, I guess. Um, scavenging. So exhaust scavenging means what can we do to help get the exhaust out of the cylinder, to scavenge it from the cylinder? That period of time when both valves are open, when the intake valve is beginning to open before the exhaust valve is closing, that's known as valve overlap. So valve overlap, both valves are open at the same time. And it happens end of the exhaust stroke, beginning of the intake stroke. If you have a vehicle with variable valve timing, uh, that can be controlled so that it's not the same at high RPMs as it is at low RPMs. Everything about an engine's breathing is kind of determined by engine RPM. So uh, you could design an engine that breathes very well at low RPM, doesn't breathe well at all at high RPM. Or you could design an engine that breathes really well at high RPM, but not at low RPM. So what they've always done, right, is design the engine to breathe best at that range of speeds where it's going to spend most of its time. So if it's a truck, engine RPM is going to be relatively low. So the design of the intake manifold, the exhaust manifold, valve timing, all of that, the, the camshaft profile, it's all going to be keyed towards a lower RPM engine. If you have an engine that's uh, going to rev higher because it's really short stroke, lightweight components, uh, doesn't need to develop a whole lot of low end torque. You got an engine like that, everything about it, the, the design of the intake manifold, the de design of the exhaust manifold, the shape of the cam lobes, um, the, the valve timing, everything is going to be designed so that it runs best at higher RPMs. With variable valve timing, we get the best of both worlds, right? We can have that thing breathing well at low RPMs, and then as the uh, RPM increases, we can change the, the timing. We can change valve overlap. We can change all that kind of stuff electronically so that the engine still breathes well at higher RPMs. It's actually pretty cool. So let's, uh, let's talk about exhaust back pressure for a minute. So it, this is kind of uh, a challenge to visualize. So I have a video, and, and the, the video talks about uh, um, efficiency, volumetric efficiency which is basically how well does the engine breathe? You know? and, and so I think that might help uh, a little bit explaining this, but um, exhaust back pressure, I've heard some people say, you know, well, you need that. You know, if you don't have back pressure, it's gonna be a problem. And it, it's, uh, I, I don't know, that's not really an accurate statement. We want the engine to breathe very well. Um, having back pressure in the exhaust affects how well that engine breathes. So um, if we have excessive back pressure, what would be the effects? So think about this. An engine is kind of like your lungs, right? A little bit. It's taking air in, it's pushing air out, it's breathing. It takes air in on the intake stroke, expels it on the exhaust stroke. If you stop exhaling, you have to stop inhaling. You can't, you know, go ahead, try to inhale 10 times in a row without exhaling. At some point, you can't take any more air in. 
just can't happen, right? So the exhaust, let me turn the camera back on here a minute. Um, stop sharing this a minute. So the exhaust um, is like exhaling. And so it determines the design of the exhaust system and the restrictions in the exhaust system determine how much air flows into that engine every bit as much as the intake system does. So if you block the exhaust, the engine's not going to be able to make any power. It's not going to be able to take air in. If it can't take air in, it can't make power, right? So excessive exhaust back pressure, the biggest problem would be uh, the engine wouldn't be able to go any faster, wouldn't be able to make any power. I've had uh, I've had experience with this, you know, several times, and uh, the symptom with excessive exhaust back pressure is the, the customer, the driver complains that the uh, the car just doesn't have any guts, doesn't have any power. It won't go over a certain speed. You don't feel misfiring. You don't feel roughness. Um, it runs fine at lower speeds where it doesn't need to pump as much air through, but it hits a specific RPM, 2,000, 3,000 RPM, and it just won't go any faster. Just won't do it smoothly. It's like somebody took a, a brick and put it underneath the accelerator pedal, so it's only going down just so far. So restricting the exhaust is basically the same as restricting the intake. How do we normally restrict the intake? We close the throttle. We take our foot off the gas, right? It's the same effect. <clears throat> and I've seen it uh, for a couple of reasons. So the, the most common or the biggest reason, <coughs> excuse me, would be uh, a catalytic converter melts down. In funeral missions, you know, you'll talk about catalytic converters. And uh, one thing, catalytic converter takes unburned fuel coming out of the cylinders and it's a catalyst so it doesn't get involved in the reaction but it cre it causes a reaction between that unburned fuel and oxygen that's in the exhaust sometimes that oxygen is pumped in by an air pump sometimes it's just uh whatever's in there so it it it's a catalyst, so it creates or causes a reaction between the unburned fuel and uh, air, oxygen. Under normal conditions, um, the catalytic converter gets pretty hot. That process releases a lot of heat. Uh, but, you know, it's able to shed that heat and uh, it's able to handle it. If there's an excess amount of unburned fuel entering the exhaust, then the catalytic converter uh, overheats. I've seen them glowing cherry red underneath the car. And when the catalytic converter overheats, the honeycomb the substrate inside that catalytic converter can actually melt. And then instead of looking like a honeycomb, it just becomes a solid block and nothing can pass through it. Um, so, a uh, plug catalytic converter typically caused by a bad misfire. Bad misfire lets all kinds of unburned fuel into the exhaust. The catalytic converter melts down and plugs. That will cause absolute performance problems. Car will not want to get out of its own way. If it's bad enough, the first one I ever saw, uh, the vehicle wouldn't even start. So the customer put up with the poor performance un until it got to the point where uh, it wouldn't even start. It just, you'd crank it over and it would spit the air and fuel right back out the intake because if we just build pressure against the exhaust, that was an extreme case. Other things that could block the exhaust, uh, inside the muffler, you have baffles. And if they come loose, they can block off the exit. Um, usually either of these things, if you take a rubber mallet or something and tap on the exhaust system, you might, hear things running around, you know, flopping around inside there. So that's a quick check. Uh, we also have the, the ability to do an exhaust back pressure test. 
and see if there's a problem with it. Typical exhaust back pressure numbers, a couple pounds, a couple PSI, you know, two, three, you know, it's not 10 or 15. If it is, the engine's not going to run right. So that's uh, something to keep in mind. So let me get back to the uh, back to the slides here. Turn me off here a minute. Okay. So what would be the effects of excessive back pressure? Uh, performance issues, big time. Or if it's bad enough, you know, potentially no start. But that's that's kind of really rare. So uh, let's see. Engineer fuel requirements. All right, I don't want to do that yet. What I want to do is uh, I want to show this video on uh, volumetric efficiency and engine breathing. So uh, where are we? Volumetric efficiency. And then we might as well watch the one on exhaust scavenging too, because I was just talking about that. So volumetric efficiency, how well does the engine breathe? You know, if it is capable of taking in, uh, you know, a half liter of air, but it only takes in a quarter liter, then the volumetric efficiency is only 50%. You know, if it's capable of taking in a half liter and a turbocharger pushes more than a half liter in there, the volumetric efficiency is over 100%. Let's watch it. Sorry if there's ads. The AEM Infinity ECU is legal in California only for racing vehicles, which may never be used upon a highway. Right. <laughs> Sorry about the ads. VE stands for volumetric efficiency, which is essentially how well the engine is using its cylinder volume. We've all heard the saying that an engine is an air pump, and that's completely the case. What we use that pump for is to extract the chemical energy in a gasoline and turn it into horsepower. Volumetric efficiency is how well that engine does it per its given displacement. You don't increase performance by throwing more fuel at it or less fuel at it. You increase the performance of an engine mostly by increasing how much air is moving through it. So if you've got an engine with upgraded camshafts, an engine with different cams is going to flow more air at certain RPMs than an engine with stock cams. And it actually may flow less air at other RPMs. It becomes more or less efficient at moving air. When you change things like camshaft intake runners, like on the intake manifold, uh, exhaust runners and exhaust, exhaust pipe diameter, all these things are about moving air through the engine. Volumetric efficiency is just how efficient is the engine at packing those air molecules into that volume. The higher the VE, the more efficient the engine is, the more air it's moving. Thus, it's making more power. Uh, you'll notice many times that uh, your VE table looks a lot like your dyno graph, and that, that's no mistake. The more air you're moving, the more torque you're going to make. And a lot of times at peak torque, you're going to be right around 100% VE, and that's no coincidence. Unlike pulse width based systems, VE systems use airflow as their primary foundation. If you know your airflow, injector size, and target AFR, then a VE-based system like the Infinity will automatically determine how much fuel is required at any RPM under any... Okay. Um, like I said, sorry about the ads, you know, but it's, uh, it's not a bad uh, quick and dirty explanation about volumetric efficiency. So let me uh, shut myself back off again here and... Um, Let's look at the exhaust scavenging. This one's pretty interesting. In this video, we're going to be talking about why exhaust back pressure is bad. We're also going to be talking about exhaust velocity and exhaust scavenging, which are both good. And so first, we're going to start pretty basic, and then we're going to get into some more complicated aspects of how exhausts work. Uh, so starting with the very basics, we have our engine here. It's got an intake. It's got an exhaust. The power stroke has just happened, so our piston is at bottom dead center, and we're about to press out all that exhaust, uh, those spent combustion gases, once this exhaust valve opens. So within this chamber, 
Pressure is about six to seven times atmospheric. It could be more or less depending on the engine design. Of course, outside, pressure is atmospheric. So about six to seven times as high inside the cylinder and of course one atmosphere outside uh, coming in your exhaust. Now once this exhaust valve opens, of course that high pressure is going to want to leave and go towards the lower pressure. Uh, and so we're going to define back pressure as pressure with the opposite direction of flow. So of course as that valve opens, the high pressure in here wants to escape because there's lower pressure out here, so it moves out the exhaust. Now back pressure would be resisting that. Uh, so we have atmospheric pressure outside of the exhaust. So one way to think about this, why back pressure is bad, uh, take for example if you were to lower atmospheric pressure uh, extremely low. So now you have a vacuum out here. Well now the pressure differential between outside and within your engine is even higher. So the exhaust is going to want to go out even faster. Uh, now the whole purpose of an exhaust is to evacuate those spent gases as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Now, if you were to take pressure that was way above atmospheric, let's say it was 10 times atmospheric pressure, well, now that's going to resist that exhaust coming out. So once that exhaust opens, if ambient pressure was 10 times what's inside here, you're actually going to have air flowing reverse. It's going to go the opposite direction. So you can see that as you increase back pressure, it does the opposite of what you're, you want your exhaust to do, which is to evacuate and get rid of those exhaust fumes as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So back pressure is bad. It's not a good thing. So why do people say, well, you need some back pressure? Well, it's kind of misleading and it has to do with exhaust velocity. So restrictions create back pressure. If you have a super restrictive exhaust that's a really narrow diameter exhaust, that's restrictive, that's going to have a lot of back pressure. It's also going to have a very high velocity uh, because you're forcing all of those fumes out to a very tiny channel, so they're going to move very quickly. If you have a super large exhaust, you're not going to have much restriction, uh, but consequently you're not going to have much velocity uh, of your exhaust flow. So your exhaust is going to flow too slowly uh, to escape out into the atmosphere. Ideal is somewhere in between. Uh, so a restriction causes a negative effect, which is back pressure, uh, but it also causes a positive effect, which is high velocity. Uh, so you want some balance of, of you know, velocity uh, and minimal back pressure. Somewhere in the middle is that sweet spot where you have good exhaust flow, good speed to it, you have good scavenging characteristics, uh, but however you don't have too much back pressure, resisting that flow, resisting your exhaust escaping, uh, meaning you would be making less power. Okay, so now let's get a bit more complicated and talk about header design and exhaust tube length design. So you have your four-cylinder engine right here, and here you have the header, of course, exaggerated with these diameter widths here. Uh, but regardless, the four cylinders, they all merge at one point as they come out into these exhaust pipes into a collector, where all four then flow together through the rest of the exhaust. Well, there's a process here that happens that is ideal for exhaust scavenging. So we're going to talk about how this process works. So the first thing that happens is you have, of course, your combustion phase. Now your piston's at bottom dead center and you need to release those exhaust gases. So the exhaust valve opens and immediately a positive pressure wave is created that travels outward at the speed of sound. Of course, behind that, following that, are the exhaust gases coming out because of that pressure differential. So that pressure wave continues to move down your exhaust pipe uh, through your exhaust and then, of course, your exhaust gas is following behind. And once your piston gets about halfway up, now you don't have quite as big of a pressure differential between inside the cylinder and outside the cylinder. And so the problem with this is, is it means your exhaust gases aren't going to want to travel. The remaining exhaust gases that are still within that cylinder aren't going to want to travel out very quickly. So that's a problem. We, of course, don't want those exhaust gases to remain there uh, because that means our next combustion cycle won't be as effective. Okay, so this pressure wave is traveling along, and any time uh, a pressure wave changes, uh, reaches a point in the piping that changes diameter, it's going to reflect back a pressure wave. Uh, so any cross-sectional change will cause this. So a collector, for example, um, if the piping were to step up or step down, and of course as it exits the exhaust at the very end uh, of your tailpipe. So anytime there's a cross-sectional change. And the amplitude of that reflected wave that's coming back uh, is, you know, proportional proportional to how big or small uh, that step is, that change in diameter. So if the change in diameter is larger, the wave that's going back uh, is going to have a greater effect. The amplitude will be increased. Now, a positive pressure wave, uh, which is what comes out initially, uh, is reflected back if you were to step down. So if this collector were to get smaller, which you of course wouldn't want to do, it would send back a positive pressure wave. Because it's getting larger, it sends back a negative pressure wave. And so that negative pressure wave starts traveling back 
And what you want to happen, so that piston all the while is of course still moving upwards. What you want to happen is for that negative pressure wave to come back at the exact right time. Uh, and there's going to be a bit of a window, so it doesn't have to be you know, one specific RPM. But generally, this will be a, a good effect for a specific RPM range uh, rather than across the entire RPM range, of course, based on the tubing length and you know, based on diameter, things like that, uh, which affect how this pressure wave comes back. So it's coming back. You want to time it so that just before that exhaust valve closes and your intake valve opens, that negative pressure wave arrives and helps lower the pressure in there, pulling out the remaining exhaust gases. So you have basically an entire empty chamber. Then Then with that low pressure, once your intake valve opens, it helps pull in fresh air because you've got a bigger temperature or a bigger pressure differential between the intake and within the cylinder. So if you get that pressure really low within the cylinder, right before that intake valve opens, it helps pull in additional gas. Uh, and of course, that means you have uh, better scavenging, better scavenging, and then as a result, you have more air and fuel that gets pulled in and you can make more power. Now, again, this is all dependent on that pipe length, of course, because it has to do with how fast does that wave travel. It reaches the collector, creates that reflected wave once it hits the collector, and then travels the way back through those exhaust gases. So during that process, uh, you want to time it so that it arrives at the right time. And these can help out different cylinders. It has, doesn't have to necessarily be the exact same cylinder, uh, but you get what's going on here where you want that negative pressure wave to arrive, help pull out those remaining exhaust gases, and then help pull in uh, that fresh intake air. Now on top of this, there's something called inertial scavenging. And so if you think about like throwing a ball or a car driving, uh, of course behind that car is a low pressure area because it's pushing the air out of the way. And the same thing happens uh, with these exhaust gases. So when they open up and it sends out that high pressure exhaust pulse, that exhaust, uh, that air has inertia to it because it's traveling at a very high speed. And so as it travels through the pipe, it creates a low pressure area behind it. So as it's traveling, it can start filling up this area with low pressure. And that's, of course, dependent on its velocity. And its velocity is also, of course, dependent on the piping diameter. So if it's too wide, it'll have a low, low velocity and it won't have that very low pressure area behind it. If it's too restrictive, uh, you have too much back pressure. It's not allowing those exhaust gases to escape. Uh, and that's causing your engine to have to work harder to push out those exhaust gases. Uh, so, you know, there's a sweet spot where you have the perfect amount of scavenging from both uh, wave scavenging and from inertial scavenging, where this piping diameter uh, and the piping length are both very critical in the performance of your engine for a specific RPM range. Of course, if you were to tune this incorrectly, if you were to have the wrong length, you can hurt the performance of it if you have this wave arrive at the incorrect time. It can actually be detrimental and cause you to have even less power uh, than if you didn't do this at all. Uh, so timing is very important. Tubing length, tubing diameter, all very critical in how this system works and how you have that exhaust scavenging. So hopefully, you know, this is a decent uh, basic overview of how this all works. Gives you an idea of why you don't want back pressure, uh, but why you do want scavenging and you do want exhaust velocity to help out with that scavenging. So thank you all for watching and if you have any questions or comments feel free to leave them below. Okay so that was kind of a lot of information there. Uh, let's just concentrate on what the most important takeaways are from that. So um, Exhaust uh, is every bit as important as intake. Okay. The size, shape, length of the exhaust system, <clears throat> headers, tubes, you know, runners, all that, they affect uh, not just how well an engine breathes, but more importantly, they affect at which RPM the engine breathes best. So if you ever look at torque and horsepower curves for engines, it's funny, you'll see some make their peak horsepower at, you know, 4,500 RPM. Another one might make its peak horsepower at 6,500 RPM, and you wonder why, right? Um, this goes a long way towards explaining it. The size and shape of the intake runners, the length of the intake runners, uh, the diameter of them, those also affect at which RPM, this engine breathes both, uh, best rather. So just some, some stuff to be aware of. 
you know, slapping on bigger uh, parts is not always going to going to maximize your performance. I had a guy way back early on. He uh, he was a big Ford guy. He had a big block uh, Ford Grand Torino, I think, and. You know, he went out and he got the biggest intake manifold and the biggest Holly double pumper carburetor and headers and all this. And um, the, the thing just, it, it didn't make very much power. You know, certainly no more than in factory. So everything works together. The, the size of the valves, the valve timing, the valve lift, the intake manifold design, uh, the exhaust manifold design, all of this affects how well the engine breathes at various RPMs. So all engines will have an RPM at which they breathe the best. Uh, it's different for every engine, and that's when it'll make the most power, wherever it breathes the best. If you have variable valve timing, you can stretch out that, uh, that RPM range so your torque curve is a little flatter. It doesn't just peak and drop right off again. Another thing sometimes they do is variable intake runners. In other words, there's a little flapper door that at a certain RPM shuts off the long skinny runners and opens up some short fat ones, which are better at high RPM. So all kinds of things are, are being done out there uh, you know, that affect engine performance. It, it, you need an engineering degree, I think, to really, uh, you know, understand it completely. But if you are planning on doing something to your car, you know, a lot of times uh, the high performance manufacturers, you know, if you buy a, you know, a different kind of camshaft for your car, they might recommend a certain, you know, exhaust setup with it, uh, certain intake setup with it, you know, what size throttle body do you want and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, don't just slap the biggest of everything on and expect to make the most power. Okay, I, th I think uh, for today, we're not going to go too far into this um, engine air fuel requirements. So this is just kind of an assignment for when you're out in the shop paying attention. When somebody's using a torch, uh, oxyacetylene torch. So it's not that different from an engine. You're taking a, a fuel, a hydrocarbon fuel, which is the acetylene. And, you know, you're combining it with oxygen at the torch head and you're burning it you know, what an engine cylinder does, right? So if you notice, if you just turn on the acetylene, pay attention out in the shop or you've seen this, if you just turn on the acetylene, let me get rid of this uh, and uh, just talk to you here face-to-face -face a minute. So just turn the acetylene on, light the torch, what do you get? You get this weak orange flame and you get a whole lot of carbon uh, if you just only do the acetylene you're going to cover everything in the area with soot black carbon um, and the flame is not going to be very hot i wouldn't recommend touching it but it's, it's not going to cut any metal it's not going to heat anything up significantly except maybe a cup of coffee so you start adding in oxygen uh, you turn the other knob and start adding in oxygen and now the flame changes from that orange uh, to a nice bright blue. And if you get the ratio correct, so the air fuel ratio on that torch, the flame, you know, temperature is maximized. And the amount of, uh, you know, soot, the amount of unburned fuel, if you will, that's escaping into the air, smoke, you might say, uh, is minimized. So you got a nice hot flame, you're not wasting any fuel. What happens if you go too far? If you add too much oxygen, um, eventually the flame goes right out. So there's a, uh, if I borrow that guy's term, there's a sweet spot where the mixture of air and fuel is at the right ratio that it maximizes the uh, you know, combustion efficiency. So that's what we're going to start talking about next week. And uh, I'll mention, you know, in lab, if you have questions, by all means, we're going to be in the lab together uh, in the next few days. Or for some of you, you might be watching this, you might have Monday Night Lab. 
so maybe tonight you'll be in lab with me and you know let's talk about it this is kind of weird not having face-to-face -face lectures because there's no back and forth discussion there's no opportunity for you for you to tell me you don't understand what i'm talking about and uh, so sometimes people do not and i know that i i get questions back in the live lectures that tell me the person asking that question did not understand what i was saying that's not your fault necessarily i just didn't explain it right maybe so uh so this is weird. Uh, I never did an online class until last semester. So just, just trying to do the best we can here. Uh, try not to put you to sleep too much. The nice thing with these videos is you're you're not trapped watching it all at once, right? You can um, you can pause it and go take a break. Come back when you're when you're ready to listen some more. So I do like that part of it. You can also rewind if uh, if you didn't catch something I said. You can rewind and listen to it again. Also, don't forget, um, you know, you've got all of these. Give me a minute. All of these things. There we go. On Blackboard, you know, this is module one. The slides that that I'm using. Those little pictures on timing. All of these videos uh, you can watch whenever you want. You can watch them over and over again. There are some chapters from the textbook here. So uh, it's all good stuff. Go back to lessons here, module one. Okay. We'll talk uh, about some of this stuff later on. Sparkplug heat range, reading spark plugs. Stoichiometry is really what we're going to be talking about next. Stoichiometry is that air fuel mixture where uh, you know it, it burns most efficiently. So that's it for this week. You can uh, check out this video or look up things about air fuel mixture. Ask about it. Um, you know, talk about it in lab, and uh, then I'll see you again in uh, in another video next week.